Well, thank you for coming. Um, and, you know, when people invite you to do a talk, you have to be a very brave person to actually take that literally. And I'm not that brave, so that means I wrote an essay. And what's worse, I didn't memorize it. So this is not going to be very charismatic. Uh, I'm just going to basically read what I wrote. And then I do have some handouts, and um, we'll be talking about, we'll be looking at them kind of briefly when the time comes. Uh, the first two on this page that says Hope Atherton's Wanderings, that is a fragment from a Susan Howe poem um, from the articulation of sound forms in time. You don't have the whole poem there. And the same with Andrew Joran, who's not as well known as Susan Howe, but I hope some of you know his work. I think it's worth getting to know. We're going to be looking at some of his poem, Eclipse Calling. I actually meant to Xerox all of it, but failed to get the last section. And then finally, a poem by Michael Palmer, and there we do have the entire poem. And then a couple of poems of my own that I'll talk about briefly. Um, I guess the, the way that this talk got started, I mean, even before I was asked to come to Chicago, is that I'm, I, I've been working with some other poets on a project called The Grand Piano, where we write, about, we write suppose, supposedly autobiographically, but sometimes really about our poetics. And I wrote, in the, in the eighth volume, I wrote an essay on lyric, Mainly because I had felt, I guess, when I was when the when the uh, language poetry was starting out, and a lot of it was uh, written in the form of the so-called new sentence, a kind of um, structured prose poem. I won't go into describing that too fully, but my continued interest in poetry that might have looked like lyric poetry sort of put me a little bit on the outside of the group where, you know, it was there was a question in some members' minds uh, about whether I really belonged in that group. But they were my friends and they were the people I was talking to and they had presses I wanted to publish in, so I, I didn't, you know, didn't really want to reject them. I thought they were very uh, intelligent and interesting people and I still do. But there was this tension. And so because of that, I wrote an essay on lyric in uh, one of the installments of The Grand Piano, which is kind of looking back at the origins of language poetry. So I had a little bit of thinking about the lyric already you know, on my mind. And then in order to write that, I had um, read two new books about the lyric, which I'm going to be talking about briefly today. One of them is by Bob von Hallberg, and the other is by, and I may say her name wrong, a woman at Brown. Mootloo Blazing, uh, best I can do on it. Interesting book. Um, okay, so I did, from there on, I'm just going to read. Lyric poetry, after enjoying tremendous prestige in the early and middle 20th century, seems to have fallen out of critical favor in the century's later decades. It was too much identified with individual subjectivity to suit either Marxist or post-structuralist critics. This is true despite the fact that the definition of lyric poetry is pretty slippery. Is it necessarily identified with the short autobiographical monologue, the expression of its speaker's feelings? Is it closely related to music? Is it simply any poem which doesn't fall into the categories of epic or dramatic verse? In other words, a default position for poetry. This lack of clear definition didn't seem to matter, however. For most late 20th century academics, poetry was lyric poetry, and it had to do with the assertions of a mysteriously authoritative speaker, and as such was something to be leery of. It didn't matter that during this same period, poets such as Susan Howe and Ronald Johnson, whom Robert von Hallberg has recently written about, were dismantling the traditional lyric subject or speaker in poems which still sang and still conveyed emotion. But something has changed since the turn of this century. There has been something of a renaissance in what is called lyric studies. An issue of the PMLA, of all things, was devoted to the topic. 
And recently, two very interesting books have appeared about the lyric. Lyric Powers by Bob von Hallberg and Lyric Poetry, The Pain and Pleasure of Language by Mutlu Blazing. Both of these books serve to broaden the idea of the lyric poem and what it may consist of. In his first chapter, Authority, von Hallberg, sorry if I refer to you suddenly now by your last name, I know it's alienating, makes one of, <laughs> after you have dinner together and are on a first name basis, then suddenly, okay. Von Hallberg um, makes one assertion that I, at least, have never heard before, and that is, the most distinctive authority of lyric rests on its affirmative function. He goes on to say, at its core, its approval of the fullness of experience made evident, oh, I, I've left out a word. At its, at its core is approval of the fullness of experience made evident by the unwillingness of poets to subordinate difficulties. I like that sentence. According to von Hallberg, the lyric poet whom he associates with Orpheus engages with the unknown in a way that is in some sense inherently religious. Interestingly, von Hallberg uses Ronald Johnson's work, including his book, Radios, A Writing Through of Paradise Lost, as his prime example. There are many things I like here, including the way von Hallberg apparently doesn't seem to require the presence of a, of a figured speaker within a poem for it to be considered a lyric. I base that on what he wrote about Ronald Johnson. Certainly there is no such speaker figured in Johnson's work, no one who has come back to tell you all. Some lyric poets whose work often does rest on the affirmative function quickly come to mind. There is, of course, William Carlos Williams, whose cat finding its footing between the jam closet and the flower pot is an image of the sufficiency of being. And then, in a different vein, there is Joy Graham's more bedazzled and desperate affirmative description of complex phenomena, especially wave action, as in this from Dusk Shore Prayer, sun making of each mile-long wave retreat a golden translucent forward downgoing, golden sentences writ on clearest moving water. Graham's work might be said to be Orphic in that it mourns what it celebrates. I wonder about the emphasis on the affirmative in von Hallberg's essay, though. To be, though, to be fair, he does go on to say that there are great poems of mourning and that even the poets most dedicated to the celebratory know that joy can't last. Despite that, though, he seems to argue that the essence of the lyric is its ability to celebrate. Would this, ex this, this seems to me that it would exclude so many poets whom I might have thought of as lyric, although that definition is always arguable for many reasons and, and not only for this one reason. But would it exclude poets such as Susan Howe, whose work often enacts, and I'm not sure whether she considers herself a lyric poet even. She might consider herself an epic poet. I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just asking. Would this exclude poets such as Susan Howe, whose work often enacts a kind of Orphic dismemberment of the statements and voices it employs? Howe's work, which often, though certainly not always, has dealt with the early colonial experience in New England, conveys a sense of terrifying wilderness, the feeling of being lost and frightened. It conveys this negative emotion partly through the way the text is radically fragmented, the negative stance of Howe's work, though, is not only about the sense of displacement in a new and overpowering wilderness, it is also implicitly a record of damage done and a judgment on the negative effects of the colonist xenophobia. Does this alone make it different enough from Johnson's work to assert that his long poem is lyric and her long poems are not? I'm not really sure what Robert would say to that, but I'm, he'll probably tell us later. So how do we delimit lyric? I want to briefly discuss Susan Howell, Michael Palmer, and Andrew Joran. I hope you're familiar with Andrew's work, but you may not be. I've passed out examples of all of these. Um, Andrew Joran is someone in the, in the Bay Area who I think is um, gaining more recognition now. He's just had a third book come out. He started out identifying himself oddly as a science fiction poet. And his work as it's developed has sort of left the fiction behind but kept some of the science. So I relate to it in that way since I'm also interested 
not as much as he is, but to some extent in bringing science into my work. Um, anyway, so I, I have an example of his work too. Um, I think that all three poets could be considered examples of what you might call the negative sublime. They write at the border where meaning dissolves into code and differentiation. This can be a frightening prospect. Mutlu Blazing also uses a god or demigod associated with loss of control and dismemberment in her discussion of the lyric. So I think that's interesting. Paraphrasing Nietzsche, she discusses the Dionysian and Apollonian aspects of poetry. According to myth, Dionysus was the one of the many bastard sons of Zeus, and uh, of course, Zeus's ever jealous wife Hera was uh, upset and ordered him dismembered by the Titans at the moment of his birth. But Zeus was able to recreate him by using only the discarded heart. Dionysus, reenacting this original trauma, a Freudian might say, went on to become the god of wine, orgy, and the general disordering of the senses. According to Nietzsche, the lyric arises from the tension between the Dionysian abandon and disruption and the Apollonian impulse to restore aesthetic order. Or, as Blazing puts it, quote, when representational reality returns from the Dionysian oblivion, it must return as a figure. And then that, as with the affirmative function in the other essay, that sort of stopped me and made me wonder. This figure might refer to what is called the image in poetry, perhaps, or it might be the represented human personality of the speaker. I tend to think that she means the second, but I'm not positive. Blazing makes me want to respond, must? It must return as a figure? Really? Why? Some of the most enthralling poetry I've read is poetry that does not return from the abyss with coherent imagery or a recognizable speaker. Instead, it remains there. Susan Howes, and now you can look at this first page, um, Hope Atherton's Wandering from Articulation of Sound Forms in Time opens with some historical information, which I don't give you here, but that's the first page of it, about the actual figure of the Reverend Hope Atherton, who accompanied a contingent of colonial soldiers in a skirmish with a group of Native Americans. Apparently, Atherton became lost, and after wandering hungry for several days, he attempted to surrender to the Indians who would not accept him. At least that's the story he told when he chanced to find a white settlement. For reasons that aren't quite clear, the townspeople didn't believe his story, and he was held in general suspicion thereafter. So the poem begins here with what might be the figure of a speaker, but hardly an authoritative one. Howe takes on and undermines the heroics of the traditional colonial narrative. The words of the poems that follow, and you see four of them here, and there are, there are a number more, might sometimes possibly be attributed to Atherton, but more often not. Um, for instance, the last line in the third poem, which is the at top of the second column, that last line, deep water, he must have crossed over, seems perhaps to be a reference to Atherton, someone speaking about him. But often here, um, the phrases are from anonymous voices in, in a wilderness. The first phrase, pressed, try to set after grandmother, um, has no specific relation to Atherton's adventure, although it does suggest being lost and separated. It does so, however, in an anti-heroic, tragicomic tone. If grandmother has gone ahead and been lost to sight, then is this the wilderness of time and death that's being referenced, and not only the American forest? Is the history through which this story comes down to us a signal through deep water? And that is part of the poem, too. I think I'll read just this first poem. Pressed, try to set after grandmother, revived by and laid down left, lee, little distance each other and fro, saw digression, hobbling driftwood, forage, two rotted beans and etc., ready to faint slaughter story so, gone and signal through deep water, Mr. Atherton's story, Hope Atherton. Um, 
So where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, syntax and even words seem to break up under the pressure. False possession and real loss are repeated motifs. The poem delivers neither what Pound would have recognized as an image nor a unitary speaker, but it does communicate a sense of scale and a sense of loss. It evokes what I have called the negative sublime. Next, let's look at Andrew Joran's poem, Eclipse Calling. Here, too, we, we never see any recuperation of a speaker. In fact, I think we're farther from it than we are in, in Susan Howe's work. In Susan Howe's work, there's, there's the sense that, there, that someone has gotten lost and then has not been recuperated into a coherent self. In Joran's work, I don't think there ever was the assumption of a speaking or coherent self. Um, I think since you probably don't know his work, I'm going to read maybe, his, maybe section 0 and section 1. Notice that it's unusual. It, poems with numbered sections are common, but for it to begin with zero is unusual. And I think that calls attention to the numbering scheme. Zero. Poured orbit, oh, an all-rounding river of last regard. Given nothing for, given. Cannot rest, but runs in countercurrents against that pax that poverty of state, as contorted as letters, the bodies lie still below the readable surface. To those who come to comb raid musics out of matter, read, red eddies desire as swan, as swoon of dawn, commune of all that cannot be thought. Earth and blood are even because divisible, Heaven is odd because indivisible, so free from prayer. A free word says death, or better, death to the president. Imagine the spoken O's, spokes, convergent on no center. No place is polis, but there are violins preceding violence. A word is birthplace of the plural body. As wide-eyed as wild eyed I and I, achieving signature upon inverted landscape sky, accepted into vastly revolving ocean as shock of nudity, that posture foaming to far pasture, to pure field. Here first person is maintained, an archaic device, somehow stopped inside its own velocity, its substance dissimilar to itself, its living moment, relic of a mov moment, movement unarriving. Well, I think there's one thing that uh, ties this to one traditional idea of lyric poetry, and that is that it's very much grounded in sound, in, the, in, in almost sound-alike words, um, and also in the relation of, uh, of numbers to letters. We never see, as I said, a recuperation of the speaker in Eclipse Calling. Instead, to quote, as contorted as letters, the bodies lie below the readable surface. Subjectivity inhabits figures in this poem, but never congeals into a recognizably human figure. An aura of subjectivity inhabits, in particular, numbers and letters here, without quite crossing the border into outright personification. Zero becomes O, and both are poured orbit, all rounding river of last regard. One quickly becomes the first person singular pronoun, I and I, wide eyed as wild eyed. As Joran puts it, here the first person is maintained as archaic device. The number two, which I didn't actually Xerox for you, the number two section, which introduces the, the, the number two, which introduces the third section, doesn't conveniently resemble a letter as zero and one do, but the poet lets us know that he is invoking the second person in that section, i.e., to quote from it, "O oh my other mother-throated one, name between abandoned body, the twin of of." In this poem, in its three section, in this poem, in its three sections, plays with the pronoun. Well, anyway, 
This poem, in its three sections, plays with the pronomial, but finally prefers to tease us with a sense of subjectivity that comes from everywhere and nowhere. This is pre- and post-subjective. One might see Joran as either pantheist or nihilist. What is completely clear is that meaning here is sound-driven, tending to lapse into the Dionysian phonemic abandon that Blazing wrote about. Another poet of what I'm calling the negative sublime is Michael Palmer. Let's look at his poem, which you do have complete, and size again, Autobiography 15, which I guess I'll read aloud since I think it's worth hearing. And size again, Autobiography 15. A sea of small killings Invisibilities, precise, sense of night, in its wetness, its edges of bloom and inflection, a woman, chestnut fleshed, nipples erect, a sins, a kind of cross, her companion, her double, her accomplice in this, helps her rise up with her tongue. Out of the dark they are fashioning a rose, a window. They are examining the mathematics of the fold. They are baking themselves in salt that we of little faith may be saved from the dampness and the dark. They are writing a book of common knowledge, a book of maxims and proverbs, such as a father might pass on to a son. Did I say father and son when I meant farther and farther from the son? Did I say fold when I meant fault, salt? when I meant song, dark when I meant a little bark, steering straight into the storm, boat, little boat with sail of stone. Are you bearing an alphabet among the rats in your hold, an A, B, C, D of twinned bodies? Is the skin of this city your own city over which another city floats, skin of a retinal machine, salt sea of invisibilities? So this is a complex poem, and I can't possibly deal with all of it. One thing I could say is that Palmer has a series like this in which he's sort of unwriting his autobiography. The poem begins with a, de a, a depiction of night filled with both small killings and edges of bloom. Out of the night arises the surreal or perhaps dream image of a naked woman ascending a cross, assisted by another woman's tongue. Is this crucifixion or a kind of lesbian orgasm? That is a heretical overriding. The product of the women's action is both intellectual and creative. They are examining the mathematics of the fold. They are baking themselves in salt. Well, I won't reread it since I read it once. Here, in an oblique fashion, to at the end, where they, they are writing a book of maxims and proverbs, such as a father might pass on to a son, here, in an oblique fashion, we see the reference to father and son we might have expected to encounter as part of such a crucifixion story. It's interesting that this woman and her double are examining the mathematics of the fold. That image suggests the erotic, of course, but also the science of chromosomes and proteins. It suggests both reproduction and self-consciousness. It's no accident, perhaps, that this poem is written almost entirely in couplets. Doubling and twinning are motifs throughout. One might also argue that the poem, in a sense, has two halves or parts. We've discussed the first half, which ends with the maxims a father might pass on to his son. From there on, the poem repeats and retracts and then replaces select terms from the previous parts. For instance, did I say father and son? when I meant farther and farther from the sun? Did I say fold, fold when I meant fault? Dark when I meant a little bark, steering straight into the storm? So he's taking back everything he said. He's, he's uh, doing a kind of erasure on it. Here, more explicitly than in Joran or How, we see meaning collapsing into sound. It's interesting and perhaps disturbing that sonic resonance, which seems to mysteriously persuade us, can also effectively replace semantic sense. The poem that sounds right, 
produces something like a truth effect, no matter what it says. Palmer often plays with this fact. His poem is the little bark heading into the storm of the arbitrary signifier. Meaning here is dwarfed by the potential unmeaning. This too is an encounter with the negative sublime, which it turns out offers its own seductive pleasures. And I've surprised myself having reached this point by having, having chosen to write about how Joran and Palmer, people I've never written about before, although I think highly of all three poets. But after all, their work doesn't much resemble mine. It seems difficult to infer much about my poetics from the above discussion. My poems, which tend to be short and are often colloquial, hardly seem to invoke the sublime. However, I have been described as a poet of skepticism or doubt by both Stephen Burt and Robert von Hallberg. My work has some stake, therefore, in critique and neg negation, if not in the sublime. My poems tend to read, I think, as if spoken by a person or persons, but at the same time, they tend to put the speaker in question. The speaker is somehow beside herself. She is, as Rambeau famously said, another. Does she realize it? Does the poem? I'm going to read a poem called The Way, and see if I can find it. So this is from uh, my book, Veil. The Way. Card in pew pocket announces, I am here. I made only one statement because of a bad winter. Greece is the word. Greece is the way I am feeling. Real life emergencies or flubbing behind the scenes. As a child, I was abandoned in a story made of trees. Here's the small gasp of this clearing come upon again. So I'm not going to belabor my own poems to death because I think that's kind of bad taste somehow, but I will say a few things about them. Um, so what if the speaker in this poem is Jesus, as in I am the way, I am here, um, and a madman, and the singer of a silly popular song, and is also, of course, Ray Armentrout. What if the speaker discovers herself to be, in some sense, all of these things? My poems tend to reveal an abjection that is, I think, not particularly personal, but rather partakes of the shame of being finite, of having limited knowledge or self-knowledge, of being created, not self-created, of finding, perhaps, that you have the words to the song Greece stuck on repeat in your brain and you don't know why. And then let's look at a, a poem from my new manuscript, one I read last night called Sustained. I guess I'll read it again and then I'll talk about it briefly and then we'll be done. Sustained. To come to in the middle of a vibrato and is that some sopranos struggling to sustain. To be awake is to discriminate among bird calls, fruits, seeds, to work one's way, as they say, through. Just now, breaking into awareness, falling forward, hurtling inland in all innocence. So to get back to the issue of the speaker, well, anyway, uh, uh, this poem seems to deal with repeatedly waking up in the sense of having what turn out to be ephemeral realizations. First, someone, arguably the speaker, wakes into an ongoing reality, one apparently created and tenuously maintained by another, the soprano. Responsibility seems to be elsewhere. Then, in the second section, someone, the speaker, seems to tell us, in a convinced manner, that she has become convinced of her own efficacy. She now knows and understands what it is to be awake. She tells us that we are discriminating and empowered. And we, of course, tend to identify with that state. 
the speaker can discriminate not only among bird calls, but among fruits and seeds. Why these things? This is a rather bird-brained list of concerns or areas of expertise. What is the speaker, really, and who are we? A soprano? A bird? Neither? Whoever or whatever she, he, we are, we work our way through. It's a common, innocuous phrase. We're working our way through what? And then falling. We wake up for the third time in the third section to find ourselves in motion. We seem to be traveling and then hurtling inland like a wave, or rather a tsunami. We have a history and are about to make history. How did we get here? All we can do is assert our innocence. These poems have not so much an unreliable narrator as an untenable speaker, and yet I do somehow mean what I say. Okay, so that's the end of what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's always hard to be first. I have two totally trivial questions. Oh, good. Start. Uh, what is the Joran book from which Eclipse comes? Fathom. That's Fathom, okay. And the other thing was uh, the way, you said that was from Vale? Yeah, um, it is. For, uh, Vale is a, is a selected, but there's, it's a new oh. one selected, and it's from the new part at the end. Okay, good. Because I was like, I, I know this poem, and I don't mm -hmm. have it until yesterday Vale. So, okay. Well, it, you may, it's only been published in Vale, so I, but it was, it was talked about on Penn Sound, if you listen to Penn Sound. Mm, could be. Okay. okay. So, Ray, I got a question about the Andrew Jordan. Yeah. I was really struck by your describing it as a poem in which there's never a recognition of Okay, maybe never is too strong. There was the mother throated one. No, but. but <laughs> I might be reading, I might be misremembering. Um, and also, potentially, uh, linking its orphic quality to a pre- or post-subjective position. And what I'm wondering about is how one might both endorse those observations, but then also interpret lines like, a free word says death, or better, death to the present. Uh, death, death to the president does come in as a, a, a kind of uh, frame-breaking moment there, that's true. Right, and then you mentioned the other frame-breaking moment at the end of that section right here, first person is maintained mm -hmm. archaic device. So I just wonder whether you think that the pre- or post-subjective position can also be kind of a cover for a subjective position of a certain kind. Well, I guess that in, in a way it has to be since a, a person wrote the poem, but then, you know, the, the person chose to write the poem in the way that, that he chose to. So I think he, he is interested probably in, um, I see it as a kind of strangely pantheist poem in a way, as I said, either nihilist or pantheist, but um, as uh, in, in which there's a little bit of subjectivity, you know, in all of the elements, but they don't really gather into a one human-shaped clump that's going to speak to you. Yeah. Yeah, I just, um, I'll just continue, like, in talking about the same poem. One of the things that I find really interesting um, is that actually when I was, when you were reading the poem and you were talking about the numbering, um, I was surprised because I just kind of looked through it. And um, the, the similarity between the typeface the, or the font of the title and um, the numbering actually made me read the zero as, oh, and I was starting to think that, oh, this is going to be, you know, a, a poem about apostrophe. And, and then I and and then it sort of felt like one, 
But did you notice that the the uh, figure that begins it is in a different typeface than the O in the first line? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. But I was thinking as a you know I'm reading this way. You know, like yeah. Linear, and then mm-hmm. you go back and you, yeah. you make that observation. Um, but I, I just I I'm interested in what you think about the the sort of status of apostasy um, in today's work. Well, he 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 did have you know. Um, Oh, oh, my mother throated one at one point. I, I don't think I actually have that Xerox, that section, but um, and, but that's a, but you're asking a broader question. What do I think of the state of apostrophe in the? Right. I mean, it's, it's not it's not, not on. Suggestive here. Not right? often done, really, but. Um, <laughs> right, right. I just and what does that have to do with the kind of uh, these, you know kind of the affirmation, the, the mm-hmm. sort of skepticism, say, that's entered into um, the, the notion of the self. Um, I think that, you know, those, those things are tied together. Okay, I'd have to think about that more. Imagine the spoken O's, spokes convergent on no center. Um, that's in section one. Um, no place is polis. So he's He's using that O that might be an apostrophe mm-hmm. as as the kind of you know empty space of, yeah, of a zero. Yeah, it's a placeholder. It's a zero, mm-hmm. and it's the O. Yeah. You know, of apostrophe. Yeah. You know? uh-huh. so, I mean, he seems to be playing both sides of the coin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I know. I think that's why it's kind of haunting, really, and haunted. It's probably haunted by subjectivity. I mean, how could it not be? Yeah. But then, don't we see the world as sort of haunted by subjectivity? Even, <laughs> I mean, even if, if if we are modern rationalists, I think we, it's hard to stop seeing it that way. Yeah. It's a small question, but it's just to develop this uh, point. Just as a footnote, Kelly was saying that this essay, famous essay by Jonathan Culler about apostrophe, in which he's arguing that apostrophe is the most uh, poetic of figures uh, or tropes. Mm. Um, and so that essentially an apostrophe is synonymous with the idea of poetry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what I wanted to ask you about is the, the critique of, of personhood. Um, and I, and I, just, I wanted to ask you about the motive of, of that and that I, I I'm accustomed to reading two two bases for critiquing a coherent person um, uh, as the origin of the poem. One is, um, and this is from the language of the writers, that it's corny, uh, and that and so I mean a lot of the language polemics are based on that. That it's sappy. I don't think anybody ever used the word corny or sappy, but that might have been the sense you got. <laughs> Do you not get that sense? Do you think I'm? I'm um, I, I think it was sort of out of out of favor. I'm not. I'm. Yeah. I guess that there there at the at the time that language writing started, there it, it was sort of the heyday of the kind of. Um, short autobiographical lyric associated with, let us say, maybe Sharon Olds or, um, and you know, there, there, there were examples that seemed to, you know, foreground one's own life with a little da-da as exem- exemplar, you know, and I guess, I guess that probably struck people as corny if not sappy or, or at least something that was tiresome at the, po- at the moment. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then the other the other ground is the academic literary theory based doctrine that language begins in codes and not in and not in individual uh, speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And so, um, so I, I, this is really just a question about: are, Does that exhaust it? Uh, the those two the the reasons for uh, for being opposed to. Uh, well, I don't think it exhausts it for me in that, first of all, I don't necessarily think that the language poetry take and the Bart Derrida take are 
you know, absolutely separate. I mean, certainly, you know, the, the influence of structuralism and post-structuralism was being felt at the time that the lang language poets cohered as a group. Um, but I think there's a more visceral reason for it that has something just to do with um, maybe the, the way we live now in a very scattered way. And, you know, the, the, the fact that um, perhaps compared to, you know, a, a sort of life pre-mass media, we do have a lot of voices in our heads. Well, I mean, in a way, one always has. You've always had your mother and your father talking to you in your head, right? But, you know, now you've also got Glenn Beck in there somewhere, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> and it goes on and on, you know? And so, um, you know, who speaks when I speak It can become a question because um, I, it's not that I don't believe in a self, or it's not that I don't believe in sincerity, I just don't think that they're simple or certain, you know, they're, they're a, a little bit elusive, because the more closely you look at them, the more you see them constructed of parts, you know, of detritus perhaps. Now, there may be a constructing element inside us that is the real self that sort of chooses how to fit the pieces together. I'm not saying there isn't. Um, but still, you know, we are um, in, this, uh, in this world where we're drenched in language that is uh, very much othered. And do we try to ignore it? Well, we can try, but I don't think you could succeed, you know. So um, I think that, uh, I mean, in a way, Eliot was dealing with that same thing in the wasteland. And that was before the age of mass media, really, but just, you know, this, the life of, of the city as he experienced it. Um, past, pastiche is, is, is a kind of, um, or the, a kind of visceral, visceral experience for me anyway, you know. I, so I don't think, I don't feel like, oh, I read Bart and realized that, <laughs> you know, um, the, the author was dead or something. I mean, I don't even really think the author is dead, although I, I like that essay. But, um, but I, I, I think that, it, you know, to ignore that this kind of um, fractured texture of subjectivity is just to sort of ignore modern life and ignore where you are. And it doesn't work to do that, I don't think. I guess I, th I, th I think that there are a number of ways of, there are a num n number of ways in which the history of poetry reflects this notion that there's mm -hmm. some other source for poetic language. I mean, this is, it's not clear that there's a Homer there in the Iliad. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it's, it seems there's evidence that it's mm -hmm. made up of language by other people and, mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. So it's, uh, while I can understand, while I can feel the force of the, uh, I can feel the force of the, the, the it's, so, it's corny, it's sappy mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but as a theoretical point, it doesn't seem as though um, the theoretically based um, argument against the representation of a, co a coherent personhood doesn't seem like it really bears, it gets, gets a deep purchase on the history of poetry. Uh, maybe, other, maybe other media, uh, you know, and there are certainly moments, and you can say, well, Wordsworth or something like that, you know, but so much of this discussion of inspiration and so forth. Mm -hmm. So many poets for centuries have been saying, I didn't write this, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, in one way, in one way mm -hmm. or another, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. alluding, in, I mean, you know, here there are, there are in this poem, there are quotations mm -hmm. and, and recycling, and there are in your poems too, of language that's coming, but this has been going on for a long, yeah. a long time mm -hmm. too. So I guess I just, you know, not that you ask me, but I, th I think that this doesn't have. I, I never feel the, the the power of this as bearing really against my sense of what the art of poetry is, except in the instances of like Sharon Olds and Sylvia Plath and, and you know, and say Wordsworth and the, the yeah. narrow band of literary history. Right. I guess I guess that that band was just very prominent in in my youth and still you know people people have sort of people will say well you know I'm attracted to a a, a poem where I can see the poet behind it yeah. 
and and sometimes um, people have people have told me that my poetry is difficult, and they have said, "Well, why don't you set the scene first, and you know, then tell us who's thinking these things and why?" And um, I, I guess my, the most honest answer for me is that because I, I'm not thinking that way myself, so how honest is it to put that on the page? I don't go around thinking, um, here I go sitting on the front porch, here it's me looking out there at the world, now I see, you know, I mean, you know, I want to I wanna work at the speed of thought, and I'm not constantly representing myself to myself. So, you know, that to give everything a narrative frame to me would be um, artifice. I don't know. It doesn't interest me. In some ways, that seems like an even more authentic representation of subjectivity than one that participates yeah. more in kind of trapping the narrative or yeah. conventional role. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it's the dramatization of authenticity that irritates right. me. No, I don't think anybody's irritated by the sense that something's authentic. It may be mysterious how something can be authentic, um, you know, given the long history of the world, how, how did this thing come to be new? But, you know, everyone sometimes has that feeling that they're in the presence of something new and they're, you know, enchanted by it. Well, this is a related question to that. This is just kind of, um, your personal experience as a writer, do you feel like in writing through these various, um, various voices that you as a writer long for an authentic self behind it, or do you are you comfortable with the myriad voices that we're very much used to and in contemporary life? But do you still long for it? So is it a writing through all the voices to get to an individual voice? Because some people have talked about post language writing is starting to get back towards this this self. And I'm not sure if that's a reasonable argument yet, but is it something you long for or are you comfortable with it? Well, I, I think my my own thought processes and my own experiences do come into the poems. They just come in on a kind of equal footing, you know, with the other material. Um, so the stuff that comes from the inside and the stuff that comes from the outside is just sort of treated in the same way. Um, I, uh, some, of the, some of the material that sets me off, uh, you know, is material that irritates me. So, yeah, you know, so, some of it I don't like, but I, I, I'm thinking somebody ought to look at this. You know, <laughs> somebody ought to look at what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing here. So sometimes I start that way. Um, but I think that where I'm kind of most me is in the way I arrange the parts to, to talk to each other in, in the poem together. So I maybe, wanted to. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. I uh, know you go ahead. Um, I wanted to go back um, to the term you used a bit in your talk, the negative sublime, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting because if it's a sublime and it's negative, does it cancel itself out? And then connect it maybe also to this term. I think you only heard you use one time, but poetry that does not return from the abyss. I'm thinking about the sublime mm -hmm. and the abyss, and do they have? Much in common for you in, in this terminology. Well, I think the I think or? the the abyss is very much part of the classical idea of the sublime in that it's huge, and you can't encapsulate it. You know that the I think that goes back to Kant, right? Is that you know the pretty is what you can manage. The sublime is perhaps the beautiful that's terrifying because it's out of scope, out of out of scale, and you can't manage it. Um, so maybe the sublime is always in some sense negative. But I think in the examples that I gave, it's um, a, a little bit more dramatically, negatively tinged, as in um, Susan, well, Su Susan Howe is constantly dramatizing this encounter of the, the small band of colonials with this world that they can't comprehend. So in a way, that the sublime is the world that you can't comprehend. Um, and then. If, Palmer um, is, is maybe the most clearly negative here in that he sets up scenarios and then just says, no, I didn't mean that. I meant this. No, I didn't mean that either. What I really meant is this. And it's obvious that I could go on forever and that he's, there is going to be no final term to stand on. So he's cutting the ground out from under himself. And that, too, is to realize, and that goes back, I guess, in a way to philosophers like Derrida, but to realize that you can do that forever and never come to a bottom, 
is uh, another kind of sublime that's a sublime depth. You could fall forever and, and you know, never hit the, the final, you know, word that you can stand with or on. You never stop making meaning. <laughs> So yeah. I, I was also curious about the, the negative sublime as a kind of category that you're kind of putting forward in the talk. And I noticed that when you turn to the poems of your own, uh, the sublime kind of dropped out of the conversation and you, were, you talked a little bit more about the negative. And so I was just wondering if you think of, and that actually rings true to me, actually, that uh, unlike the three poems by poets who you put before us, uh, your poems seem mistrustful of the sublimity of Joran's O oh Mother, mm -hmm. you know, or yeah. of Howe's Wilderness, or of, um, of Palmer's, you know, uh, Ocean of the Alphabet, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I was just wondering if that's something that you feel is is different in your work, and yeah, I, they have a they have a that's... tone that sort of that they share that I don't really share. Well, first of all, you just can't call yourself sublime. <laughs> <laughs> I, me personally, I. So that we don't, we don't that's no, that's a non-starter. But but yeah, there there is a, there's a way in which. You know, their work is never funny, and I, I guess I, as you can tell, I, I, um, I think that humor is, is, is destabilizing in itself. That's always part of what humor does. It, it uh, sort of changes the, ooh, here's that icky word paradigm, but I can't think of another one, you know. It does a really quick, pulls the rug out from under something, and, um, that's always, you know, funny. It makes something take a prat fall, and that might not be unrelated to what Palmer's doing, but it's in a different tone, you know. Yeah, in Palmer, it's more like a kind of dark, Byronic, mm -hmm. you know, laughter yeah. in the face of the abyss. <laughs> in yours, it's more <laughs> playful. Than... I kind of like for that, you know, that the poem that I just referenced in passing, um, William Carlos Williams' poem, poem about the cat, you know, stepping over the jam closet. And, you know, there's, it gets very almost melodramatic comically at the end where it's, you know, into the pit of the empty flower pot. <laughs> well, I like that flower pot, too, you know, which I guess maybe you could argue that People like Joran and Palmer don't get to the flower pot. I don't know. But <laughs> I don't know, but I don't mean to. I don't. Now you're tempting me to set myself up against them in a positive way, which is not where I intended to go either. It's just a little different. I have another, another little okay. question. Uh, one of my favorite points in the reading last night was um, actually something that you said in between poems when you talked about the new box that goes under seats in the movie theater oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. it rattles box, uh -huh. when the hero's like spaceship gets yeah. you know, <laughs> thrown off course or something. And I think you said something about how the, uh, the assumption of that is that uh, you know who the main character yeah, is, right? right? right. Because it may be and so where close. he is and what's happening to him. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering if that was maybe a way that you think of locating the self in your poems because it seems like it's there is a strong self but it's on the periphery of where you would think that the oh, that's interesting. You know, protagonist yeah. of, the, of the lyric would be yeah that that's interesting i mean as i as i ended the talk it's not that i don't mean what i say i mean i mean it in the moment that i say it but you know i guess um, then there's another Another part of me is that does it feel more real that comes along and sort of self-corrects, you know, and, which is the real self, the self that forges forward or the self that follows along and goes, eh, that's not quite right. <laughs> um, so maybe that is a little bit like what Palmer's doing, except not quite as, he, he's doing it in a really pure form where it's totally obvious that that's what he's doing, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I like that idea. It is 
that the, the, the self is kind of thrown out of its, uh, off its throne a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. I was wondering if you might be willing to say a little bit about the grand piano and the experience sure. of writing collective autobiography in relation to self and <coughs> maybe even the materiality of the mm -hmm. form, the way mm -hmm. the exchange was done over Listserv or yeah. Internet, but then decided mm -hmm. to go into an actual small press book. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say a little bit about it. Um, yeah, that's actually the idea, and some of the writing for it actually started about 10 years ago, but it, it took it a long time to really take off and get going. Barrett Watton has really been the driving force behind it, and he's kind of whipped us all up into doing it. Um, and it was, from my point of view, I think it's different for everyone. From my point of view, it's very difficult to remember very much detail about the, the period between 1975 and 1982 or whatever, whenever it's supposed to end. And um, so, you know, it's been an exercise in memory and also a humbling exercise in the limits of memory for me. And um, I've, I've kind of used it that way to, to explore uh, the, the, the fragmentary quality of memory. And um, other people have used it differently. I, I mean, I've, I've used it a little bit to explore poetics. Like I was saying in number eight, I did talk about the lyric. Um, it's been, as you can imagine, it's been touchy because people remember things differently. And then there are those that don't want, you know, your memory to, to conflict with their memory. So uh, I think I'll look back on it in a, in a happier way than, <laughs> than I've gone through it, probably, you know, but it is almost done now. Uh, I think it's a good idea to write a collective autobiography. It, it turns out, of course, that, you know, collectives are never easy. <laughs> but um, I guess I enjoy writing, not so much writing autobiography, but writing about the prob problematics of autobiography. I'd like to um, ask about, about sound. And, mm -hmm. about, um, and about language, uh, it's very general, but I'm in, in, um, I don't have any problem thinking about Susan Howe as a lyric poet, by okay. the way. An affirmation, I would say, of survival, mm -hmm. which is, okay. which when I'm speaking about affirmation poetry, it, it has everything to do with memory. I and mean, the traditional, mm -hmm. I mean, right, with Pindar saying, you know, these athletes at that moment will survive because of my art, and mm -hmm. I put it, you know, put it in there. And, um, and I think my sense of this is close to Grossman, uh, mm -hmm. with with the uh, um, a, a sense of poetry as preservation and and praise of affirmation of what what is preserved. And I think that this is a lot of her of, of mm -hmm. this this poem in particular. This sequence is about survival mm -hmm. and preservation and the and pleasure taken in this in the sounds mm -hmm. and uh, I mean in, in the first putting March and April together in the first line is a traditional uh, you know it takes back to the beginning of, of Chaucer mm -hmm. and um, and lots of lots of play and, and happenstance uh, echoes and I think that um, uh, I think you can we can connect that to Palmer, mm -hmm. you know, that you know that the uh, fold and fault mm -hmm. and the sort of discovery of of um, of cognate pieces mm -hmm. of the language uh, there, I think, is um, is part of what's being affirmed. I think, mm -hmm. um, and the kind of the, and I don't think it's just play, you know, that the um, no and. Um, but and it, it's not much of a question, a series of, of, uh, of statements, but it's at that, at that level of engagement with language instead of at the level of mimesis mm -hmm. or expression mm -hmm. that, um, that one can speak about affirmation okay. in, the, in, these, in these poets. Um, and also about the religious uh, dimension. I mean, I don't want to push this too hard, but there's a sense in which uh, if you, if if I, if I were to like make a case for that section of the Susan Howe uh, the text, there could show all the echoing of of syllables. Mm -hmm. 
and could, I could excavate some allusions and so forth. And then I might be asked, well, and, and just what is it that she is affirming? You know, just what is it that's, uh, that's uh, surviving? And I think that, um, that I'd be a little dumbstruck at that point, and that, there, that there's, a, there's a sense of wonder in excess of what can be denotatively Describe, yeah. and uh, so I mean, I think it's that sense of an opening up into what is not going to be fully explained, not because mm -hmm. it's it's being suppressed by the author, but because it's suppressed from uh, our, our knowledge uh, that makes mm -hmm. one say this is a kind of language dealing with the unaccounted for mm -hmm. or the inadequately accounted for uh, that we know from reading devotional poetry, mm -hmm. say or. That is how she sees her project, I think, is to to try to save or collect these these voices and th that you know may have come from different sources that are on the verge of being lost. I think she very much feels, and I guess where I was coming from in my description is that she very much feels the threat of the loss. I mean, she so that so that one feels both the affirmation, but one is also very conscious of the threat and of the possibility of time just, you know, washing over these voices and then, of them being lost forever. And um, in a sense, the, the focus, the consciousness of that is, a, I guess, what I, what I was invoking as the negative sublime. But yeah, I agree that she, her, her drive is to haunt the libraries and to try to pull some of this out. Now, you know, if she, and, but I think this is what you're saying, if she thought that that somehow just I mean, why is she not a librarian who's just like saving this stuff whole? Oh, why is it all fragmented here like this if she wants to save it, you know? I think she's more reenacting the, the threat of loss. I mean, preservation's in there somewhere, but the drama is more about the threat. It mattered to me. I had a conversation with her about this mm -hmm. sequence uh, some time ago. And uh, there was one poem in particular that's uh, deeper into the sequence, and I asked her about the sources of that. And she, uh, she said to me that uh, it was not just all cut and paste, that there's pastiche involved, mm -hmm. and that she's writing in the voice of the text mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as, as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that supports what you're, what you're uh, speaking about now, so it's not just preservation yeah. in, in any literal sense, which a lot of her work does, or a lot of her later work does seem to be uh, motivated by preservation and let's get this straight and what's really going on and, uh, and, and so forth. And, um, and there's, a, there's a kind of interest in the, um, in the uncanny and, uh, and the half mad in mm -hmm, this sequence mm -hmm. that is, uh, uh, I think, profound. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm very much interested in the uncanny too, and um, I think we see that really in, in all of these poems. I mean, Eclipse Calling has something uncanny about it too that I, I don't, I haven't really, you know, tried to describe or put my finger on, but I can feel it there. Um, I guess it's, you know, it, it's that the, the same sense of the uncanny that we get when we think about um, the universe coming into existence, presumably out of nothing in some way, um, as shock of nudity, that posture foaming to far pasture, to pure field. Um, you know, that's just sort of um, that, that, you know, creation can come out of, say, mathematics, you know, as physicists tend to believe. I see some of that in, in Joran, and that gives me a sense of the uncanny, too. And I guess that is something that I look for in, in poetry. And I mean, you know, even just in the Freudian sense of the doppelganger, which I sometimes kind of in, invoke in, you know, my poems, is like, you know, who is speaking now, and is, is that person aware of the person who just spoke, and, you know, how many of us are in here? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think maybe both both that that maybe the form through sound and the sense of the uncanny are important functions of poetry for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this question is kind of related to 
to um, this idea of the uncanny because you talked about. Um, I think it was in relation to the way about how a lot of your poems have a certain kind of impersonal attraction. And I think you said um, it's a shame that feeling created and not self-created, mm -hmm. or a shame at finding words in your head that aren't your own, like a song mm -hmm. stuck in your head. And I guess by impersonal abduction, I'm taking you to mean something like, like an abduction that's unrelated to any particular biography that kind of has to do with like, yeah, like the kind human. of universal <laughs> yeah. right? But, I mean, there's also a way in which this abjection, experiencing it as shame, is like a very personal kind of relationship to this condition. Sure. Because, I mean, somebody might find the grief song stuck in their head and not feel shame, but mm -hmm. annoyance or pleasure mm -hmm. or like any other kinds of affective conditions. And so, I mean, I'm wondering if when you dramatize the kind of untenable subjectivity of the speaker in your poem, sort of showing us a kind of condition, but also making a case for the kind of attitude that we should take towards it, or the kind of attitude that you take towards it, and if that... Or like the kind of attitude that I experience in yeah, the presence of it, I guess. Personality or subjectivity. Well, in, in the way that the um, first use of I is in I am here, which is in quotes, and that really is something that I had gone to a, to a church to uh, hear... Um, you know, liturgical music, and again, you know, just fiddling around, and I picked out the card from the pew pocket, just like it says, and it says, I am here. Presumably, it's Jesus talking, but you know, it's also, yeah, I'm here. Okay, <laughs> where have we got that far? Um, and then the second use of I, I made only one statement because of a bad winter. It was something I heard a presumably um, madman saying he was sitting in a cafe talking to someone else so what he maybe he wasn't a madman but he sounded like it and one of his remarks which I wrote down was I made only one statement because of a bad winter <laughs> and so <laughs> and um, then the third use of I is um, quoted from the song Greece <coughs> so so the first three uses of I all come from different sources from Christ from a madman and from the song Greece. So I'm kind of collecting, I guess, maybe inadvertently, um, ways of a context in which I can be said. And then the fourth one, as a child, I was abandoned in a story made of trees, is the closest to being me, you know, to feeling lonely as a child. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not um, spurning all personal uses of I. I'm just putting the personal use of I in the context of these other uses of I. Yeah. So it's almost like this poem is a collective autobiography. You no, know, there you go, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, thank you, Ray. Oh, you're welcome.